Reaching for the Stars, a film review with special guest, sci-fi author, Melody Fletcher. Hello, and welcome to The Far Away Nearby, episode 22. I am Duchess Sue. At the end of World War II, Germany introduced us to astounding rocket technology. Within 12 years, the Soviet Union would push us further into the space age with the launch of Sputnik in 1957. But before the U.S. could put their first men into space, they would enlist this, the gifted minds of many American women, including 35-year-old mother of three, Catherine Gogol, Lee Coleman, a black American woman from West Virginia whose mother was a teacher. Catherine was the first African American to attend graduate school at West Virginia University at Morgantown. The daughter of NASA research scientist and an English professor at Hampton University, Virginia-born Margot Lee Shatterley wrote hidden figures based on the experiences of people in her community. She and her husband had previously lived in Mexico and wrote an English language magazine for expa- American expatriates. Before we begin our discussion of the film, let's welcome our guest, science fiction author extraordinaire and recently former podcaster of Don't Quit Your Day Job, Melanie Fletcher. Hi, nice to, nice to be here. Nice, nice to have you. So getting, getting back to our film, Hidden Figures. Mm-hmm. What was the most important moment in the film, do you think? For me, um, actually, I think it was the moment when Dorothy figured out how, how to program the IBM mainframe. And my reasoning is there, there were important moments, like where, when Harrison tore down the colored bathroom sign and when he basically informed his team that they were all equal and he was not going to be allowing any sort of bigoted bullshit with coffee makers. But Dorothy did it on her own. She went in there. She saw the mainframe. She knew what had to be done. She taught herself Fortran. And after she got it running, she wound up providing jobs to all of her computers who were going to be put out of a job by that mainframe. So I, speaking for myself, I think that was the most important moment in the film because that really said, yes, we are here. We are competent. We are capable. And you have to stop ignoring us. And I think it should be said in the beginning of our show here today that even though this is a film review, there's no such thing as spoilers when it comes to this movie (laughs) because it was part of history. So I'm sorry if you didn't read the book and you didn't pay attention to history, be prepared for a surprise. (laughs) (laughs) And what did you think the most important part or moment in the film was, DJ? I think I would have to agree with Melanie that when Vaughn figured out how to learn Fortran. She provided a future for not only herself, but her peers that showed ingenuity. You know, she wasn't going to stand and let people take advantage of her and tell her that I'm sorry, you're no longer useful anymore. She decided that she was going to, you know, give herself a future. And it was a really great moment when the people at the library told her, that uh, her kind weren't welcome there, basically. And she was on the bus afterwards with her kids, and they looked at her, and they're like, Mom, you took that book? And she says, I pay taxes. (laughs) 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 This is my book. Mm -hmm. It's true. And and that that was just one of the many times that I felt terribly embarrassed in this film. I know that all this stuff went on but I have never in my life felt so embarrassed about the bigotry that we as white people presented to people of color as as watching this film. I mean, that really brought, brought it home in a way that perhaps I was unaware of just as a general thing because I did not grow up with people of color, although there were some Mexican-Americans that or maybe, or perhaps just Mexicans that came over and worked in the beet, in the sugar beet fields where I grew up. 
I didn't really grow up with people uh, with the, the bigotry. I didn't. I wasn't aware of it because I I didn't not being part of the farming community. I didn't interact with any of the uh, the Mexican American workers. I lived in a small town. I didn't. There were no people of color that lived in town. So sometimes these things bring me up short and introduce me to things that were going on that I knew that were going on, but. But it introduces it to me in a way that that I'm not really familiar with. Well, Sue, I also grew up in a rural area, and it wasn't very cultured. I think maybe there might have been one black person in my whole uh, school experience, primary school. And that person actually moved away after that year. So, Mm -hmm. but, um, I, I had a very unique experience watching this movie and I was very grateful for it because I grew up with a strong female influence in my family and where I sat in the movie theater, I had to the left of me was a young mother and her daughter. And then to the right of me was an, uh, older woman and her elderly mother. And then behind me were two middle-aged ladies that were best friends. So I felt perfectly at home when I watched that movie, and I laughed at all the same places they did and <laughs> cried they did. It was a very powerful experience. Well, yes, it, it, it was a powerful experience. And I'm not sure I, I can tell you what the most important moment of the film was. I found the whole thing sort of the most important moment. Well, I mean, speaking for myself, I am... Yeah, I, I, I'm horrified at the bigotry that went on. It doesn't surprise me. I, I was raised on the south side of Chicago, so my neighborhood was primarily white. But we ha- I went to school with a lot of Mexican-American kids because slightly farther north of us, those were the Mexican neighborhoods. Uh, we had mm-hmm. black kids in our school. We, had, we actually had um, uh, some other uh, ethnicities as well. So I kind of got a step up on... You, recognizing that you know these a lot of these folks were not being treated very well, yeah. But what what appalls me about this movie and the information that was coming out is that we never knew that women played such a major role in the space race. We never knew that women of color played such a major role in the space race. I I was fascinated by space as a kid. I used to I would stay up and watch the the launches and the landings and my mom got me up. I was only 3 years old. My mom specifically got me up so that I could watch uh Neil Armstrong land on the moon. Mm-hmm. And to find out, you know, at my extended age that oh, it wasn't <laughs> all just white guys doing this. Well, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there were, there were, there were women there too. There were women of color there too. And the fact that this was not taught to us in schools, the fact that this didn't come out until 2016, infuriates me. Because well, we should yes. have been knowing, we should have known about this a long time ago. Because if we had, we'd have more women. We'd have more women of color in STEM fields. That's bullshit. We, we'd have, we'd have more women because in, in my in my small town, now I was in the fifth grade when we when we uh, when Je- when Glenn went up for the first shot that went up and down. Uh, I remember people making jokes about it, but my fifth grade teacher lugged her television set. This was a portable television set, but it was huge and it weighed a lot. She lugged this from home into the fifth grade classroom so that we could watch this and we sort of saw this the little rabbit ears didn't work very well and so what I saw was this really fuzzy thing it made no sense to me um and I and I never cared much about the space but I I and I was infatuated with Walter Cronkite because he was infatuated with this you know he he sat there and he and he could talk about space forever but I am also really annoyed at him that he never once said, and these women, you know, Glenn wouldn't go up without these women okaying his his trajectory. He didn't want to talk to some stupid man. He wanted to talk to the people that knew how to do this, <laughs> you know. But yeah. Walter, Uncle Walter just never told us that. 
and, and I find that rather appalling too. But they didn't show that in the film because Uncle Walter was not important to this particular storyline. But but I think that there would have. I, I agree with you if if they had shown the women of color or women in general that they were working in this field and, and important in this field. I think that there would have been a lot more women going into the science fields. Yeah, definitely. And it would have been much easier for them because I, I remember at university, it was, it was still difficult for my friends who studied sciences. It was still hard for them. And when I was in high school and I expressed an interest in math and, and uh, at construction engineering, I got lots of flack from everyone I know. This is not something that women do. Women yeah. aren't good at that. This is, you know, and I finally just blew it off. It just got too annoying because everybody, it, just everybody was telling me this. You ought to be good in languages. You ought to be good in this other stuff. Well, on behalf of the future generations, I do want to state that uh, we managed to correct the narration in Star Trek in the future generations. Now it's where no one has gone before. <laughs> and, and that was actually a step forward, if you think about it, because that was acknowledging that, yes, women are going out there too. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's men, it's women, it's intersex individuals. It's not just guys. And it, 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 there's people. Yeah, and yeah, it's people. And it's saying a lot because if you consider the source, some people believe that Gene Roddenberry was a womanizer and he put that in his show. <laughs> well, possible, but in 1969? Yeah, I mean, Gene Roddenberry also put a black woman in an officer position. In a miniskirt. In 1969. So, you know, yeah, come on. Right. In so, a miniskirt. Yes. Every woman I know in 1961 nine except my relatives were mini skirts that was a, that was a fashion choice what are you gonna do right. yeah i, I just that was so, so, and, and not only not only that he also had the first interracial kiss on television true. so you know if if gene couldn't keep it in his pants okay that's an issue but i'm not going to fault him for recognizing that women are not just sex objects because mm-hmm. yeah. he, he he tried to he tried to push the boundaries on that so I, I give him credit where credit is due so who has been your greatest female role model growing up and now <laughs> oh that was a hard one because i didn't have one no no um i uh, it uh, my, my childhood was interesting let's just leave it at that mm-hmm. and i didn't really have a female role model i was I, I, had, I hesitate to say feral, but I was kind of expected to raise myself because I was the oldest. <laughs> yeah. And so you know, my, my parents were involved in their own drama. So I didn't really have any role models growing up. I just, you know, figured out the best way that I could go. Um, role models now, I would have to say probably other writers like Esther Friesner or Elizabeth Moon. Um People who have, you know, women who have gone ahead, who've made it in what was at that point a very male dominated genre, science fiction, mm-hmm. and they made it their own. They, they carved out their spots. They received a lot of respect and awards. And that's, that's what I try to do, <laughs> even though I'm writing romance, science fiction romance <laughs> these days. Um, I still try to. In fact, I was having a, a discussion with this with somebody a couple of days ago. I still try to put themes into my work that's going to make people think. So that's – and I learned that from women like Elizabeth and Esther. So, Sue, um, who's your female role model? Well, I don't know that I particularly thought of of that. I suppose to some extent the, the older women that I hung around, like my mother um, – who was not exactly productive or or showing us a, a new way of doing things, although she got stuff done. When my father became ill when I was in the fourth grade, she went back to work, something that many women didn't do at that time period. And, you know, that – so I – and I – and I tell my friends and family, I am always saying I am my mother's daughter. I can't not do whatever because – because it's just like mom, mom did stuff. But I would guess that my my um, 
probably my biggest role, role model at the moment and 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 person that it inspires me is uh, Mrs. Obama, our our former first lady. Okay. Michelle I, Obama. Michelle, thank you. Uh, I feel terrible about not remembering her name, but I'm getting old and and having some memory issues. But she, I, I she is just incredible. She has moved from from doing a job she loved, being in a an attorney, and uh, to to being kind of the first mom, uh, taking on things like like childhood obesity. She she's she was and she's still very active in making sure that military families get things that they need she she sees sort of like my mother she but in a in a more in, in a broader sense she sees what needs to be done and does it mm-hmm. she does this more than just in her family she does this across across the board she looks at i guess in a sense i i get the feeling she saw the the family as the the citizens of the United States, and that that was her family, and that was who she was trying to take care of, and and see that things got done, and she's very competent of it so, about it. Mm-hmm. So for me, growing up, I would say probably my greatest role model was probably my mom, because in um, my family, the situation was rever- reverse of what many may have experienced. I mean, my my dad was a stay-at-home parent. They decided at one point in time that it would cost too much for us to have two cars, and mom made more than dad, so he swallowed his pride and decided that he needed to stay home to raise me, the last of four kids. So I've always looked up to my mom because she worked uh, a thankless job, some might say. She was a nurse for many years, and despite the fact that she took care of our nation's veterans because of the environment that she worked there at at the time, she later developed lung cancer. She never smoked a cigarette a day in her life, but she developed it through secondhand smoke. So that would have been my biggest female role model growing up. And I would say who I look to today are more of our public figures, just like you said, Sue, Michelle Obama. But I also think Elizabeth Warren, because she <laughs> has to be the voice of reason in uh, the current uh, state of affairs. Um, I have also looked up to many women over the years. Um, I grew up, well, actually, I didn't grow up. I was born in a town that uh, former astronaut Eileen Collins had gone to school and she went there for high school, a little town called Elmira. And um, over the years through Sue and my contact in the science fiction fan universe, uh, we came to know several different personalities, including the wonderful Nichelle Nichols, who, of course, helped recruit some of the first women and minority candidates to the space program, to the space shuttle. So I reached out to Eileen Collins, having been born in her hometown, so to speak, and I wrote her a letter saying that we were going to go to a convention that Nichelle was going to be at, and she sent me an autographed picture for myself and Nichelle at the time. So I would say that those are some pretty important figures. Also, just going back to what both of you had mentioned about Um, your early experiences with the space program and watching it. I was in, I want to say, the second grade when the Challenger disaster happened. Mm. I remember uh, having the television on in our classroom and waiting for the launch to happen. And, of course, there was a delay. And we ended up going to gym class. Well, um, we got released from gym class And went back to our classroom, and our teacher was sitting on the floor in tears. And she had the the task of having to explain to us what had happened. And all the repeats were on the screen of the explosion. And we had a group hug that day. And I'll never forget Mrs. Hunt and the wonderful person that she was to give all those young children comfort. And, of course, my school, like many... Um, planted flowers around our flagpole in memory of the astronauts. And what character do you identify with 
Catherine, uh, the mathematician, uh, Dorothy, the supervisor, Mary, the engineer. Um, I like Dorothy. And the reason why I like that is because she she's no nonsense. She knows what she needs to do and she goes out and does it. And if people try to get in her way, she just quietly goes mm-hmm, and finds another way to get what she needs. So I, I like the determination. I like the care that she shows to the women that she's working with. And that that's one thing that I really kind of strive to do in my own personal and professional life. It's because – as a writer, I I have a duty to provide good entertainment to my readers. I also, I think I have a duty to ease the way for other up-and-coming writers. I, I try to help them. I try to make sure that they get an even shot, that they you know avoid the pitfalls and the money grabbers and things like that. And yeah. <laughs> so but there are a lot of, there's a lot of scams out there. And they, they kind of prey on first-time or newbie writers who don't know how to avoid them. So I, I like to be able to say, no, you don't want to go with them. They, they go check out Predators and Editors. They will tell you the truth about what's going on. So, yeah, I mean, I, I resonate with Dorothy. I really do. Because she's – and also because she – she put up with a lot of crap, especially from Kristen Dunst's character, and then finally, <laughs> and very deservingly, earned her respect in the end when she decided to start calling her by her married name and not just by her first name. Mm-hmm. That was that was a peer to peer change, you know, instead of supervisor to inferior. So mm-hmm. that that made me really happy. And when that happens, you know that you've done something right. Yeah. Well, for me, um, it's kind of a cross between. I, like Melanie, uh, like Dorothy, and I identify with her. I I like to think that I take charge when I'm in a situation. Um, And I appreciate others who can be that way, too, because you certainly waste less time. (laughs) Mm. Um, But I also think that I I, I like Mary, but and I identify a little bit with her, because while I may not be the world's best person when it comes to mechanical things it kind of fascinates me when i can learn about how something works or how something is made that's one of my favorite shows on the science channel is how it's made (laughs) (laughs) i'm not sure that i that i really identify with any of these women i uh, i am i admire all of them and I wish I was more like like any of the women that they that was there. I uh, I, I just have never um, managed to get that kind of uh, of energy to to do things and overcome obstacles. But I am I certainly admire all of these women, and I guess to some extent I I sort of see. Dorothy would be sort of my, again my uh, closest to to a person I would identify with I, in the quiet in the very quiet way that she went ahead and did things and just didn't ask she didn't always ask permission <laughs> yeah ah uh, because if she asked permission she knew she wouldn't get it but if she went ahead and did things and accomplished such thing then she was in a place to come up and say, "Oh well, yes, we can we can program that for you." Where the guys are still having problems with that <laughs> with that stupid IBM when uh, when it came time to actually use it, and um, I was also kind of impressed that the that nobody really trusted those machines right off. They weren't they wanted that human computation because they weren't sure that the machine was gonna give them the right answer. And so why they wanted it double checked by a computer that actual that they knew would work. But wasn't yeah. wasn't that so great though, that moment in the movie? I mean, early in the movie Dorothy figured out how to get the car running when they're by the side of the road. It's true. And then later on, when the when the eggheads can't figure out how to get the IBM running, she's like, Oh, they put they hooked it up wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good scene. I like that. <laughs> yes, I just I, but it was just, they just, it, the guys just couldn't seem to get it together to figure out anything. 
Uh, and I think that's partially because they thought they knew what they were doing. And perhaps because she had grown up as, as, a, as a black woman, she had been in a position where she frequently had to do things like get the car running because she knew that if she were stopped on, on the side of the road, she was not likely to get help from anyone, especially a white person. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that she was likely to be stuck there until either a black mechanic came along or she could figure it out. And so she learned to figure it out. And I loved that car. I always wanted to have one of those. Uh, my family had a 57 Chevy, but they didn't have the fancy Bel Air model. And, you know, and we- that was a fancy model. I just, I, I thought, it, I almost laughed when her friend was calling it a junk of a car because that's like, that's a car that. Even muscle heads want these days. <laughs> and, and you know, it's kind of funny if you think about it, because we guys still have trouble reading instructions. And in a lot of uh, traditional couples, uh, dare I say, um, a lot of women are asked to be the navigator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Melanie, how did you feel about the U.S. space program as a child? Did women have a big enough role? I, I know we talked about this a little bit. Uh, I loved it. Because I was interested in science fiction from from childhood. And so the U.S. space program, I never thought I'd go into it because I, at that point, I wanted to be a doctor. So I, it never really appealed to me to you know, join one of the military branches and try to become an astronaut. But I, I love the possibility. I love the idea of getting us up there, of putting bases on the moon and Mars and building space stations and, you know, maybe, please God, coming into contact with friendly aliens. That would be great. Uh, I, I just, it, that was something that appealed to me deeply. It still does. And did women have a big enough role? Not for a long time. I mean, it's, you know, how long did it take us to get women into the astronaut corps? You know, it, it wasn't until I was an adult. So yeah. I, I don't think that, and now I'm finding out, well, there were women there all along. We just didn't know about it. Mm-hmm. So I would have appreciated it if we'd known about that earlier. And I think that if we had, we would have had female astronauts far earlier than we did. I, I think you I think that's true. So, I, I just don't I don't know how how we missed all that, but well, I do for the same reason that we treated people of color so so sh- shamedly. In in my case, but there there's a, a little bit of a difference in years here. Not too many though, because as I like to say, Sue's about the age of my aunt and Melanie, I'm assuming you're probably somewhere around my older sister. So it's I'm fifty one. Okay. So Yeah, so that's about right. The Duchess and you were kids when the the moon programs were on. Yeah. And about the time that I came into this world we were into the space shuttle program. And as I mentioned a little bit ago, you know, I grew up during the period of the Challenger disaster and the Hubble telescope. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I could turn on TV and there's probably more coverage then. As far as how I felt about the space program as a child, I wonder if maybe it could have been more commercialized than maybe when you were kids. I remember having building block toys that had elements of the space program in them. Yeah. I remember, uh, and we'll get to this later, movies about the space program. So it was certainly more commercialized. But I think as far as women having a large enough role, you know, there there were women in important roles, but it sounded like the only times you heard about women having a role in the space program, it was when, you know, we were achieving we are breaking new boundaries like Eileen Collins, the first woman to pilot the earth, a pilot to shuttle an orbit around the earth. Okay. Well, is there a, a navigator or, you know, payload specialist? That's a woman that's on the space shuttle. You know, we didn't hear about these things. Women were just, it was like they were planned out to be put into these roles. So they would be visible. You don't have women consistently in the program. Um, I, I think to a degree that is true. I, I would like to see more women. Um, and you, you are right. I mean, we, we got to see the firsts, we got to see Sally ride, 
We got yeah. to see Eileen Collins. And then it was kind of like, oh, well, we, we aren't going to mention all of the mission specialists and the payload specialists. And that would have been useful to mm-hmm. have them out there. And, and the ones on, and not only the, the astronauts, the ones on the ground, the engineers who were in mission control. I'd like to see some of the women who were there. And we we didn't really start seeing that until I think maybe the late nineties. Well, I don't know. I I was not terribly interested in space. I was more interested in things going on on Earth, political science, and things of that nature. But I don't remember people. I don't remember women in the in the control room. You know, in the mission mission control. Yeah. Okay. I don't get the, the, the I, there were not women there until until pretty recently. I'm not sure when the when we lost the first uh, shuttle, there were any women in the control room. I and I'm not sure when I, I don't think there were any women in mission control when level didn't go up uh, and they had the problems with the oxygen. Well, according to, you know, Apollo 13, there were definitely no women in the mission yeah. control there. So. so I don't know if they were in the control room, but they obviously were still around. Working there, because, yeah. Because yeah. Uh, in, in, the, in the book, Hidden Figures, they talk about uh, the, the women that, they, that she is covering still being there mm-hmm. into, the, into the 90s and stuff. So they must have been is still being uh, doing doing those kinds of things, and I'll bet when they went into those conference rooms to figure out the what they needed to do to get them, you know, to to get them oxygen and keep them alive. I'll bet there were women in there because uh, these same women and and other people that worked with them. Yeah, you would have think that you'd have Mary in there working yeah. you know, as one of the engineers <laughs> trying to figure out, okay, how the hell are we going to get these guys home? Right. Yeah, the, Mary and the other three hundreds and some women that were there, uh, doing those things. I'm sure that they were there. They just didn't depict them, so yeah. we never it, it, we never saw them. It was sort of like the uh, the things that we never saw black people do. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. when they when they made uh, strides and things, we we just attributed it to uh, to white people mostly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very much so. So and 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 I think we did the same thing with men. Were there other films that depicted the space program that you liked, or or do you have another favorite film about the depiction of the space program? Um, this is it depends. If you're we're talking strictly films, I like the right stuff mm-hmm. because because I just. I really liked the way that it kind of showed the background of, although as we now know, it was not accurate or not totally accurate because it left out all of the female computers. But I do like how it, it detailed the beginning of the space program going through Gemini, sorry, Gemini, <laughs> got to mm-hmm. use their pronunciation and, um, and leading up into leading up to Apollo. But my very favorite media presentation dealing with, the space program is from the earth to the moon. Yeah. And that's because that was the Tom Hanks mini series. We have it on DVD and every so often I pull it out and I, I just watch it in sequence because it was, it was detailed. It was humanistic. It showed not just the drama around the space program, but the, the human element that went into it, the, the pressure it put on the astronauts wives, um, the basically the, the politics that went into it, the, all the backroom deals that had to be cut in order to keep this going, and now that we can add hidden figures to that, we have more of a complete picture of what was going on in order to get us to basically to the moon. Yeah, so, well, yes, this is yeah, this is true. Yeah. I noticed that in the chat room there are people mentioning uh, the books uh, books like Wrinkle in Time. Uh, and again, I I didn't I I didn't wasn't interested in space, so I didn't read these. But also a, a book uh, called uh, "Have Space Built Suit Will Travel," 
That's me. Uh, uh, my two <laughs> seminal books that really got me started off oh, in that, science oh, fiction. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What was Wrinkle in Time and Have Space Suit Will Travel mm -hmm. by Robert Hyland. That was one of his juveniles. And those are the two books that basically uh, crystallized my fascination with travel, with, with space travel and science fiction in general. So I'm sorry. I ha I sh I'm sorry supposed to be the one who's reporting on what's being said in the chat room and I, i've been <laughs> slacking and i would like to apologize to toppy smelly about that and good humor penguin because i suck so yeah melody to read this but i just happened to notice that that we had had a, quite a bit of activity that yeah. and, melanie uh, Me melanie mentioning that he had a doll when he was a kid called major major matt Man. He's an astronaut. Yeah. Melody, yeah. I'm going to have to ask you to move to the front of the class, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I don't. I didn't know when I was supposed to be mentioning oh, things like so, that. That's yes. a, that's okay. We usually have more interactive content with with others. Yeah. <laughs> well, people uh, apparently the chat room does agree with us that Octavia Spencer rules and should have gotten an Oscar for Hidden Figures. And damn, yes, she should have. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so I uh, they could have just given all the Oscars to to that movie and I would have been happy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, about me with the uh, favorite film to depict the space program, uh, as I was saying I grew up during the space shuttle program era and it's kind of cheesy, but one of the earliest films that I saw that depicted the space program was fictionalized. Um, I don't know if Melanie will recall the 80s movie called Space Camp. Oh, yeah. I know Space Camp. It was one of um, Leah Thompson's first movies. It was, a, it was a film that captivated children's hearts about the space program because it was all about the little boy who didn't fit in, who went off to space camp. And he hit it off with one of the cool kids, and he f uh, made friends with the robot, and the robot helped him get into space through a uh, a quote unquote accident. <laughs> hmm. So it, it certainly wasn't uh, you know uh, factual, but it was certainly a fun film, and I like the right stuff, you know, from the Earth to the Moon. Now I recently listened to an audio book of the book The Astronaut Wives. And I understand that that was made into a series, wasn't it? I that sounds familiar. I, I don't know could, off the top of my be, head. Yeah. Okay. I I have read some things about uh, about the astronauts' wives and their and, and their interactions with with various people. They uh, many of them were not really anxious to be. Uh, Part of part of all that popularity and all of the uh, uh, talk to people. I, re I I don't remember which wife it was, but one of the wives was. Well, she had a speech impediment. That was yeah. John, Cl John Glenn. Annie Glenn. Yeah, and and Johnson wanted to talk to her. Right, and she and he went to her house. <laughs> and she didn't want to come out. <laughs> You're right. There's a famous scene in um, I forget which movie, but. The you know they recount the astronaut telling her if you don't want the president in your living room you don't have to have him. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that's so, the right stuff. That is okay. Yeah, I, I I just but I I remember reading some of those those things about the about the wives and they were just appalled at all of this. They mm -hmm. they weren't prepared for you know their husbands had been doing dangerous work for a long time. Yeah. So Sue, what was your favorite film that depicts the space program? I can't say that I really had one. I have probably seen the right stuff because people around me have watched it on television or what have you and, and uh or Netflix and, and I have seen it. And I've probably seen other things. I have certainly watched Star Trek and I guess you could say I was a fan of that, but I I really am not a real space a real spacey person or maybe I am a really spacey person. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I didn't really get into the science. I there again I was kind of turned off by it with some of the things that we did in school. When the teacher brought in the television so we could watch John Glenn go up and come back down, it was really boring. 
the most exciting stuff about that was was Uncle Walter. I, and I'm not sure that she used Uncle Walter, actually. I think I heard that later. But he really got into the space program, and he made it more exciting than anyone else talking about it. Uh, CBS did a lot of coverage of that because of Walter Cronkite. I think the other networks, not so much. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's true. I, I think um, having Walter be one of the cheerleaders and the, the public face that was talking to people about NASA and the space program really helped provide public support for it. Well, yeah, I, I think that's true. And I think possibly one of the reasons that we're having more problems getting uh, funding is that we don't have that same public support because we don't have someone like Cronkite. Yeah, uh, no, just I would agree with really you. out there going for it. I am noticing that our good humor penguin said that I saw 2001 and 2010 and they put me to sleep. <laughs> I, have, I have never seen these, partially because I have also heard some kind of uh, obnoxious things about them and I have friends who think that 2001 is like the greatest movie ever made well, that's- yeah I've, I've got a friend who feels the same way he even he dragged me to a big screen showing of it so, so I've seen the uncut full version on a big screen and yes it is it's artistically brilliant and you know Sydney did a great job I <laughs> As a storyteller, I prefer 2010 because it has a coherent storyline. Bless you. Now, I, I liked 2001 just for the art aspect because, you know, it's a Stanley Kubrick film. I yeah. mean, film it's students Stanley are going to watch it. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> but, you know, film students are going to watch it because it's a cult classic. But um, 2010, I loved because it suggested the possibility that there was life out there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it had Roy Scheider on it, so. Who I would pay to watch, read the phone book, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's that's another thing about, uh, but I also know that uh, that there are many scientists that po- point to 2001 and say, we'll see, it's this is proof that artificial intelligence is going to be bad for oh. us. Jesus. <laughs> I don't know if I can swear on this show. Um, that infuriates me. That The thing is, I, I'm currently starting a new series as Nicola. It's called Pacific Rising, and it's set in 2048. And I've got a snarky AI in, in this, an artificial intelligence mm-hmm. named Lilith, who explains that contrary to what people were thinking about, oh, Skynet and hell and the you know, artificial intelligence is going to kill us. And she, she explains, we were created by humans. <laughs> we were trained by humans. We, our thought processes are affected by humans. I hate to tell you this. We're human. Just because we are, you know, we're based on a mainframe and have silicon instead of carbon as our, our backbone. It doesn't mean that we're an alien race. We are your children. And yeah. I, I loathe movies that assume that, oh, well, you know, because it's an AI, it's going to go evil and it's going to destroy everything because you know, they, they don't understand humans. Of course, they're going to understand humans. We are the ones who created them. Mm-hmm. That, that's, well, that's sloppy and overly melodramatic thinking. Yes, but, but based on that idea, I'm sure one or two of them could turn out to be bad. Oh, well, yeah, I'm, but, but I mean, to assume that you know, the first AI is going to pop out of wherever and immediately, you know, target all of these military satellites to destroy the Earth and, and take over. No. <laughs> that- uh, and and a, a recent movie that really chapped my nads about this, Transcendence. It was the Johnny Depp movie where he, his, in, his consciousness gets uploaded into a computer. And they wind up destroying the entire damn computer network of the Earth to pre- to prevent him from what they thought was going to be. He was going to take over oh. and, and destroy everything. And it turns out, oh, no, he wasn't. We listened to a sullen blonde girl with an eyeliner uh, addiction <laughs> and pre- pretty much shot ourselves in the nads. Because she was telling us that this is a bad thing. And I, I walked out of that movie thinking, 
fuck me blind? Okay, what is wrong with these people? You had a great concept here, and you shit on it from about the midpoint onwards, okay? Well, well you know, M- Melanie, that proves one point, though. It's it's uh, telling us that our future leaders are the reality TV stars. <laughs> Uh, that's terrible. Uh, but but there are scientists like um oh god as if we didn't know and during goblin spawn yeah <laughs> yes but, but um well it, not charles sagan because Her. he's gone but neil degrasse uh, tyson no neil doesn't think that they're going to kill us either stephen hawking now stephen, stephen hawking, doesn't... hawking has said that yes oh. that's the person i was thinking of <laughs> yeah, well, Stephen Hawking, he's a genius without a doubt. Um, he has been wrong before, okay? Well, I'm <laughs> sure he has. He has had many thoughts, and and I'm sure that the way he must practice science and think has got to be difficult because he can't he can't just go to the board and start writing things down. He has to do this through a very tedious method and i'm sure that makes him struggle and prop- possibly compromises his science from time to time he, he does have a point i think if we wind up creating ai and we treat it like it's a tool or or so, something that we can enslave yeah we're going to wind up in some deep freaking shit but if we recognize it as an intelligent separate entity and give it some rights and and basically treat it like a decent human being would. Yes. I don't think we're going to wind up having the problems that, you know, Skynet and Hal and other, <laughs> you know, a Proteus from Demon Seed, other evil well, AIs had. I'm pretty sure that we're going to find this out from Japan because they don't have enough young people or people in general to take care of their old people. Yeah. And they are speculating that in order to care for their elderly, they are going to need to have uh, personal uh, interactions with uh, with robots to to care for you know to care for the elderly and do some of the real intimate things that. It, not even a lot of people want to do, but that need to be done as yeah. one gets older and and infirm and not able to take care of oneself. So mm-hmm. we'll see what it is that is going to happen with robots and, and human interaction, I think, and we'll find that out from Japan. I, I don't know. I, I don't think the United States is that short on on young people, and I don't think Europe is either. I think Japan is has been pressing that problem. And I think also China is going to run into that Mm -hmm. because of their one child policy. Yeah, true. True. There is going, it's going to become a mushroom shape eventually because you're going to have a large older population and not enough young people coming up. So Uh that, that you're, you're absolutely right. That's going to be something that's going to be very interesting to watch. Although with our luck, we're going to wind up getting an AI that loves anime and um, <laughs> wants to dress up like Sailor Moon. So. <laughs> like, Why? As long as they'll feed me and help me take a bath, I don't care. <laughs> so so um, I, I'm not a big enough fanboy to know the the chance or whatever from Sailor Moon, but I'm sure that instead of OK Google and OK Alexa, you know the command to awake your robot is going to be something from Sailor Moon. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can see that too. Huh. There, there was a cute animated uh, series done. Oh, I want to say almost ten years ago, but uh, it was called Chobits. Have are you uh, that? I've much? heard of it. Yeah, yeah, I've never actually seen it. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it. I had a college student living with me at the time that I was introduced to it. But it's Japanese animation, and the idea is this: this uh, kid puts together a robot and brings it to life. And I guess maybe uh, the robots are only something that the wealthy people have. And so he was um, kind of shocked to find this robot just kind of discarded. But it's a it's a girl robot. And, you know, hijinks ensue. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I don't know. Um, um, before I go on to our uh, one of our last questions, I was just going to say, 
you know, you might be able to reflect on this a little. It's not really a question mail anymore as a comment, but we were talking about uh, 2001 and 2010, and I wanted to just make the comment that for a time, I had a hard time uh, getting myself to read another Arthur C. Clarke novel because at one point, and I think this is when I was in high school, it was it was brought to light that Arthur C. Clarke actually did not believe in the possibility of life in another world. So I just thought, well, you hypocrite, you write about it. <laughs> well, the thing is, the job of a writer is to bring a story to life, to touch the reader and to make the reader think. It, what the writer is writing about does not necessarily reflect their own personal beliefs or their own personal practices because – if it did, you know, we'd have to, we'd all be giving a, a real side eye to E.L. James at the moment. So, if, if he doesn't believe that there is life on other planets, that's cool. They, that he's entitled to, well, he was entitled to believe that, right? He's um, him. but the thing is, his writing inspired people to say, well, maybe there is. Let's look. Mm-hmm. Let's implement the SETI program. Let's keep an eye out. Let's see if there is anything out there, and there may. I I personally find it very hard to believe that we are the only sentient life form in the entire damn universe. But, you know, maybe we'll meet them eventually. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll wind up blowing up the planet first. Who knows? It's true. And possibly they're hiding out from us because we are so crazy. Right. (laughs) I mean, they... they, Okay, we probably live in the hood. Okay, they're they're going like, oh, that's the solar system with the little ring planets, seven planets. No, 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 no. Don't go out there. They're made of meat. You you know what meat's like. Just don't go there. We're forgetting (laughs) they've already seen our TV and heard our radio. Do you think they want to meet us now? (laughs) Do you realize what the very first... Actually, um, Contact had this, and they were right about this. Do you realize what our very first television broadcast was? Yes, but I'll let yeah. Sue answer I that. I don't, I don't remember that, no. Adolf Hitler opening up the Berlin Olympics. Oh, really? Yes. Seriously. <laughs> that's that's our uh, ambassador. Yay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't anything that went out. None, none of the, like... Uh, jive music things or none of that stuff went out. Well, this would have been I mean, in the 40s, right, Melanie? Yeah. Well, okay. uh, uh, I believe very late 30s. Okay. Yeah, because the, the jive music stuff was around that time, too. Yeah, that, that was our first um, uh, TV broadcast. Oh, that, that was, was the first TV broadcast. Yeah, as so the radio, radio broadcast would have, have hit sooner. So that, so the aliens are probably thinking, well, they got really great music. Right. <laughs> yeah. They're just run by maniacs. So yeah, once again, we'll 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 sync, you know, we'll sync up the music. That's great. Just don't go there. Mm-hmm. Just don't go <laughs> until they show that they can be a little bit more intelligent. Let's just slide by, you know. Right. Yeah, and and if you think of some of the things that we <laughs> some of the leaders that we have had so. had have. And have. Yeah. <laughs> All depends on your point of view and frame of mind and whatnot. <laughs> so, will landing on Mars ever capture the spirit of passion and competition that the Apollo missions did? That's all going to depend on PR. Because what a, part of what prompted us to go to the moon was, one, honoring the memory of President Kennedy, mm-hmm. and two, beating the Russians. So, we had this huge uh, patriotic thing going where we're going to go to the moon because that's what Kennedy wanted us to do and we're going to beat those darn commies. We would need something like that right now if, if in order for the U.S. to go to Mars – Frankly, I don't care who lands on Mars first. If it's the Chinese, fine. <laughs> right. If it's the Russians, fine. If it's the Indians, and do not put it past them. India has a kick-ass space program. Fine. Yeah. I don't care. I want I want a human to land on Mars. I want but a yeah, human I think, to start I, a pod. I, I think it doesn't make any difference who does it. Yeah. Um, we might have a say, it, 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 depending on the nationality of the people who get there first, we may have a slightly strange uh, what what we in the United States might think of as a slightly strange uh, structure, societal structure up there. Mm-hmm. Very possibly, you know? but you know what? Whatever gets us up there, that's fine. But yeah, and and just being up there is going to change that structure anyway. So, and I'm not sure that at this point in time in the United States that we have a better societal structure than anybody else. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I would, have to, I would have to disagree with you know, anyone who said, oh, yeah, we're the best in the world. Um, no. Well, <laughs> no. Well, American exceptionalism, I'm not, I'm not sure exists. Well, I, I, think, I think that it was a good thing for encouraging us to do things. I think the idea of American exceptionalism is, has helped us to to change our society and to improve our society and to stop doing some things. I think the civil rights movement in the in the 50s and 60s that we we went through, I think that helped. But I I'm I'm pretty certain that we could use another civil rights movement at the moment because I don't think we've gotten nearly as far as we think we have. No, no. <laughs> Melanie, can you let us know where we could find you? Um, well, right now, uh, MelanieFletcher.com is my personal and science fiction website. NicolaCameron.com is my science fiction, fantasy, and romance uh, website. I have a new book called Degree <laughs> of Resistance. It's Pacific Arising 1. It is a science fiction romance. It is very even – and for people who go, I don't want to read a romance, this is perfectly balanced – and I've had beta readers who've told me this. Perfectly balanced between science fiction and romance. It's I my my tech is solid. And there are going to be at least six books in this series and novellas and two prequels. So it's going to be really, really awesome. If you like science fiction, go check it out. It is available in ebook format from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, iTunes, Smashwords, pretty much anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be having an alternate history mystery come out under Melanie Fletcher in April. And that's going Ooh. to be called Most Malicious Murder. And as people who might be familiar with this, alternate history is when you take a point in history and you change it and you extrapolate what would have happened. Well, in my book, Edgar Allan Poe did not die in 1849. And in 1851, he is married and on a book tour in London when he gets basically framed for a murder in Oxford and has to solve it with the help of a shy, stammering undergraduate by the name of Charles Dodgson, who, for oh. those who don't recognize the name, will grow up to become Lewis Carroll. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of busy. So that, that's where you can find me. Sounds exciting. Excellent. Thank well, you. we want to thank you for coming by and being our guest, Melanie. And hopefully this is the first of many visits. That would be lovely. I'm more than happy to come back. Excellent. Okay. Well, well thank you. Thank you again. And I actually, do appreciate it. And I believe our chat room even appreciates you. And also, I just have to add this um, i'm working with antique computer equipment the more people who buy my books the sooner i can actually get upgrades <laughs> thank you for listening to the far away nearby visit our webpage at tfnpodcast.com find our fan page on facebook and our companion blog on tumblr this show is available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher Radio. Email us at tfnpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at tfndj. And call or text us at 720-230-6919. This show is a member of the Pride 48 Network. Find other shows at pride48.com. 